I was thinking maybe we could. There, there. I, I wanted to finish up sort of the lecture stuff that I started last time um, today, and then uh, uh, maybe we can we can talk about um, also because you guys were probably busy with uh, the projects. Okay, we can talk about um, the new geography of jobs um, next next class. Okay, so um, but I think I think there's some interesting stuff in there that will also kind of build off of what I'm talking about today, or like what we talked about today. And what we talked about last time can provide some sort of, sort of theoretical, perhaps, uh, uh, or um, yeah, some kind of theoretical or, or you know, some way to think about um, these issues in a, in a structured way. Okay. Um, so yeah. Also, uh, as you know, I'm occasionally dumb, and uh, last time I didn't when I recorded the video. I literally just recorded the video and the audio, like I accidentally turned it off. Um, so I'll. Actually, I mean, I, I was mostly, well, I'll post the video. It's going to be a video without audio. So, it, it, the, you know, the stuff that I was doing um, for the sort of the second half and driving stuff, I mean, you'll see the, what I was writing out. You just won't hear what I said. So, um, but, but I'll, I'll partially kind of re like review a little bit, some of that today in, in the process of, of finishing up. So I, I don't think there's too much of a loss there. Okay. Um, but yeah. I know why it happened and I know not to, to make that same mistake again. Okay. So, um, so that's the other thing. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so let's get started on, on, uh, sort of talking about knowledge goods and intellectual property. Okay. So this is, um, you know, this is a, this is an area where th there's more, we, as we discussed last time, there's, more inefficiencies like just sort of if you think about it theoretically there's more scope for inefficiencies um so if you think about like the sort of the old world that we've been talking about it's it's a lot of physical goods sort of stuff that's fits within the sort of standard you know classical economic uh framework okay um and it's stuff you know you own it it's your your capital it's your factory and and you sort of internalize what happens to it okay and so there's like a lot of reasons to think that things are kind of efficient. Okay. Then of course they're not actually efficient. I mean, there's, there's monopoly distortions. There's, there's a bunch of stuff in that realm, but once you step into the world of, of knowledge goods and intellectual property, I think it gets the scope for potential inefficiencies gets much bigger just right off the bat. Okay. Because you don't, you don't, you're not necessarily internalizing things. There's so many interactions between uh, different types of knowledge goods and, and it's so cumulative the way that you sort of, build off of previous experience that that uh there's a lot of scope for sort of spillovers that you can't necessarily internalize okay so if you come up with a theory or an idea okay and someone builds builds off of that you, in a lot of cases you can't really like charge them for that i mean it, it just wouldn't be feasible in terms of legally okay or like why would they pay you if they don't have to right so um there's a lot of scope for these inefficiencies okay um so that's that's the one thing okay and uh and actually there there, there was a, a court case that just came out of supreme court case yesterday google versus oracle that was just like decided sort of finally by the supreme court uh which actually touches on on some of the issues that that you know we see here okay so i'll talk about that i added in a slide to, to mention that okay so um let's hop over the slides so here we go to uh and i just got lecture five okay um <clears throat> okay so so basically we went through you know sort of this notion of of rival versus non-rival and excludable versus non-excludable so so rival means you know you, only one person can use the good at a time and that's just not true of ideas in the way that it's true of, of physical goods okay um and uh and excludable which is like you can actually uh prevent people from from using it. So with the physical good, you can prevent people from using it by just like stopping them from stealing it from you. And usually there's sort of regulations and policies and social norms that that enforce that. Okay, so um, that's that's all sort of assumed with uh, physical goods, but but with with uh, ideas and with knowledge goods, um, you know, if you if an idea gets out there, it it, it all of a sudden becomes rather non-excludable. Okay. Uh, unless you have some government policy to go out there and, and enforce it on excludability. Okay. So, um, policy just sort of immediately, it seems to be to, to creep in. Okay. And, and perhaps even be necessary for, for, uh, sort of efficient outcomes. Okay. Um, and so I tried to give some examples here. Um, and, and essentially, 
um, a lot of the uh, excludable versus non-excludable dimension is really just policy. Okay, so it's the difference between a movie that's, you know, or a book that's in the public domain. Okay, so a book that's in the public domain would be, um, I think, most of, uh, like, the, the, the Mark Twain, I think, is probably in, in uh, the public domain and things like that. I think Joseph Conrad probably is. So they're the older, you know, 19th century books are, are mostly in the public domain. Um, and you can get them in Project Gutenberg uh, in ebook format. So, uh, you know, those are sort of um, non-excludable, right? Uh, or they are not excluded, I guess you could say. Uh, people are not excluded from using them in general. And they're very easy to copy, right? Like a book is just a very small by modern digital standards. Okay, so um, even like Moby Dick, which is a very long book, is just, you know, trivial to copy on a modern computer. So, um, whereas if, so then if you, if you then go to the other extreme in terms of policy of excludable, okay, uh, you know, you have, um, you know, sort of, well, most of it is sort of, you know, books and movies that are still copyrighted where it's, you know, illegal basically to copy them uh, and distribute them and you know, on either side, basically. Okay. So, and there, you know, there's some enforcement of that basically. Okay. And then that's like the legal regime. And then if you look at um, uh, sort of the technological stuff that turns up, so you have like DRM, digital rights management, that's basically um, when they deliver the content to you, like a movie in a form that it makes it very well, somewhat difficult to, to copy that, especially to copy it at like high fidelity. Okay, so, um, you know, it, it's like sometimes it depends on what, where you're operating, but sometimes you'll, you'll, you'll like see a movie and like if you try and do a screen accord, it'll, it like won't work or something like that. So um, there's various technologies in addition to policies that sort of operate in this dimension as well. Okay. And then you've got like over the years, this stuff has evolved, right? So like about the decade or two ago, there was the uh, you know, DMCA, Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which really like kind of set the stage for modern uh, copyright enforcement for digital goods, because basically once um, sort of storage and bandwidth became uh, available enough and big enough to sort of really easily distribute, say, a, a movie, um, then, you know, obviously movie uh, studios and like people that own the rights to copyrights to movies, like Disney, for instance, got kind of worried um, that it became much easier to copy their goods. Uh, and so there, there was sort of like this change in the legal regime, essentially they opt enforcement and things like that and made, made sort of made serious penalties for, for this kind of stuff. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, so that, that was, I mean, that's largely in the past, the, the change uh, in the past, but it was, that was a, sort of a big development in, in this area. Okay. Um, all right. So then to basically go through, okay, once you introduce these notions, okay, then you start, you start bumping into this, this things relating to scale economies. Okay. Um, in the sense that a knowledge good is generally something that you pay an upfront cost to sort of think it up. Okay, you write the book, you come up with the theory, you write the song, you record the song, whatever. Once you've done that, I mean, it's pretty easy to just, okay, make another copy of the book, make another um, instance of the song, okay, uh, uh, or the movie, um, tell someone about the idea, something like that. So the, the marginal cost is, is near zero when there's just some upfront fixed cost. And if you think about it, that's, that's, that displays increasing returns to scale because if you want to make one of them you pay like i say a fixed cost of five dollars plus a marginal cost of like a cent so it's like five dollars a cent if you want to make a hundred of them okay then you pay that fixed cost of five dollars plus you know a hundred cents so a dollar that's only six dollars okay so you, you're so your total cost went up a little bit your average cost went way down okay that's increasing returns okay so you um you can produce much more without scaling up your inputs linearly okay um, so any, and if you think about it, um, if you had such a market where you have to sort of pay a, an upfront cost to enter the market, to say, to think of an idea or a, a, a song or a movie, um, once you're in the market, if you have, you know, just unbridled competition where anyone can produce anything in, in principle, I can copy your song and you can copy my song and distribute it and sell it to anyone. Well, that's going to push the price down the marginal cost and no one's going to make any money. Like we're not going to which maybe is fine in the short run, but if no one's making money on this stuff, okay, 
you might think there are not there aren't many in, uh, incentives to actually produce new instances of the stuff. Okay, at least in terms of you know private monetary incentives. Okay, so it might be that you just you love being famous. Being famous is awesome. Maybe even people are nice to you and buy you stuff if you're famous. Um, but also people like to get money. They like to be able to live and, and make a, a livelihood out of something. Okay, so um, it, it's certainly a major component of, of people's incentives, I would think. All right. Um, okay, so that's you know, increasing returns sort of invariably pop up once you, once you start walking down this road. Okay. Um, and then I guess, so the next thing is, I, I kind of skipped over this last time because it, I don't know, for some reason, I didn't, I didn't think it, it fit in the flow, but but I think it's important, okay, which is that um, this is sort of the opposite of Malthus in a way, okay? Um, you know, Malthus is all about scarcity, that you have a, uh, the, you know, whatever, the, his, his theory or just a, a Malthusian theory in general is based on scarcity and saying, okay, well, if you want to, if you scale up the size of the population, you need this scarce input that's critical for life, such as, for instance, food or land. Um, and if you keep increasing the population, which with a fixed amount of that that scarce and critical input, something's got to give. Okay, or you know, you're going to get overcrowding or something like that. All right. Um, and so, let's see. Hun, yes, the lecture is being recorded, and we're getting audio this time. Okay, so sorry, I missed that earlier. Uh, yeah, so um, yeah, so we're, we are we're, we are recording this. I'll put it up on YouTube as soon as possible. Okay, um, yeah, so so you know, Malthus was all about uh, scarcity. Okay, um, and and so you know, a, as you increase that population size, things get more crowded. Okay, so now here, it's it's a little bit the opposite. Okay, because the the way that um, these knowledge goods work is that it's sort of what matters is the the best instance or the, the best idea okay so uh you know if you have a certain population of 100 people say and they're all just kind of sitting around thinking you know they're doing their whatever job they have but they also sit around and think about ideas um from time to time and uh sometimes you know someone comes up with a great idea and, and they tell everyone and and productivity improves okay um so this is this is more like a utopian sort of the society i'm describing um but you know, so so, but but what matters is, is you have a new idea and it spreads to everyone, and everyone can use it. Okay, um, and so if you think about a society of a hundred people, and then you go to say a society of a thousand people, now you've got a thousand people thinking up new ideas. Okay, and you're going to come up with more ideas, but everyone can use them. Okay, um, and so that's that's the non-rival, non-excludable dimension that everyone can use them, and really, there's there's almost nothing you can do to stop everyone from using them. Okay, so. Um, yeah, so that's that's sort of the opposite of Malthus because when you make when you increase the size of society, things actually they get better, okay? Um, rather they don't get overcrowded, you come up with more and better ideas, okay? So so I think that's kind of cool, and and it, maybe it's a mechanism by which we you know society broke out of what was perhaps a Malthusian world at some point, okay? Um, if you think about like you might even think that sort of changes in technology facilitated that. So if you think about like the printing press, obviously a pretty big deal technologically, that makes it much easier to diffuse knowledge, to store and diffuse knowledge. Okay. And so maybe, you know, you have, you're in a Malthusian world, the printing press is in, invented. Thank you, Gutenberg. Um, and it becomes much easier to diffuse knowledge. And all of a sudden now increasing the population. Yeah. Maybe there's some overcrowding, but it has all these benefits in terms of productivity because you can diffuse that to the, the greater populace. Okay. Now, back then, not many people could read, so that's another sort of bottleneck, but maybe it also encouraged people or incentivized people to, to learn how to read or to, to somehow figure out a way to, to get someone to teach them to read, right? So um, you might think that there's sort of these meta technologies that uh, could facilitate such a transition, okay? So um, I, I think that's kind of interesting, okay? And we're gonna, well, what the theory that we talked about last time sort of embodies that, okay? And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more. Okay. Um, all right. So then we went through the policies. I won't go through this in too much detail. Um, to uh, to to fix that non-excludability, right? So that with the when I was talking about these increasing returns, getting out of Malthus, that's the non-rivalry is that everyone can use the idea. Okay. The flip side of that <clears throat> is that if it's if it's not excludable, 
then if I come up with an idea, then it's just like everyone finds out. It's like, oh, well, I, I didn't really benefit from that. Okay, so um, excludability gives you uh, some way to internalize the benefits, right? So if you can exclude other people from using your idea, you can also sort of exclude them contingently, say, on them paying you or something like that, right? So, so um, having excludability allows you to start internalizing some of these things. Okay, it also kind of limits the flow and diffusion of knowledge, which can be bad, but it, but at some point there's sort of a trade-off between those two things, okay? And that trade-off sort of between, between providing incentives, which are sort of the long-term benefit and sort of the short term of, of just like letting people use stuff, okay? Diffusing knowledge and, and, and letting people learn stuff and, and enjoy, say, content. Um, that's the trade-off that we're navigating with, with these policies, whether it's, you know, patents or copyright, uh, you know, to, to some extent, trademarks and, and things like that. Okay, so um, yeah, and so uh, and and in fact, there was you know I, I mentioned a, a minute ago there was there was a big case that that was like just decided by the Supreme Court this Google versus Oracle and that relates to this um, fair use exemption for copyright so so part of navigating that trade off is you kind of want it like they kind of want to let people use stuff a little bit but not too much okay so you. They want to let people use stuff in a way that sort of facilitates cooperation, okay, and cumulative development of, of knowledge in the future, but that doesn't sort of cut into people's incentives too much, okay. Um, so they're, they're kind of trying to have it both ways, but 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 at the end of the day, you you do want to sort of balance these two. You you don't want to go to either extreme, okay. And so that's why fair use kind of exists. And so fair use would include things like um, you can play a clip, you know of a song, right? So I know that like on Twitch, there's a lot of uh, like with the streaming in general, there's a lot of stuff about like, do you have the right to use this? Like you, you're a streamer, you're playing a game and you want to like include a song, but then you do it and some algorithm decides that that's not allowed and you get you get cracked down on or something like that. So there's a lot of, especially now with with um, with streaming, there's a lot of new sort of scenarios that uh, pop up more frequently and you kind of have to decide either sort of technologically or policy-wise, what, what the, the proper balance of strike is, okay? So so fair use would include something like that. You wanna play a snippet of a song. You want to sample a song and some other song. Um, you wanna play a clip of a movie. You wanna write a parody of a book or a movie and things like that. So all that is sort of encompassed in fair use, okay? Now that's just for about the, the way I described it just, just then, I was only talking basically about sort of um, artists, you know, creative endeavors like uh, music and books and movies. Um, but also for whatever, for various reasons, you know, so software was, it, it sort of lived in both the patent and copyright realms. Okay. So it's sort of in both at the same time, because it's, it's a technology, but it's also sort of fairly specific, right? So you like, you write a piece of software to do a particular task, but also the software might embody sort of general I uh, say an algorithm. Okay, so you, you know, the software might embody a, a, a particular algorithm for sorting things or something like that. Um, but the way that you do it is, is, is you know, a specific piece of code. Okay, so it sort of looks kind of like a book in the sense that it's kind of it's based on text, but it's also a technology in the sense that it uses um, potentially new methods to to accomplish things. Okay, uh, so software though has kind of been um, on on both sides of, of this, um, uh, and also it, it's. Really, I mean, it, it, well, it's it's old, but it's also in some sense relatively new. If you think about the patents, pets have existed for quite a while. You know, the U.S. Patent Office is is part. You know, it's, it's required as part of the Constitution, so it's it's quite old. Uh, so so in in those sort of long horizon terms, it, it's it's fairly new, and they had to sort of, you know, they they sort of integrated it into the the system piece by piece and just sort of on the fly. Okay, um, but it's here. Okay, you know, and, and, and it's it's fairly mature now the way that they think about it. Um, and so and so, yeah, so but the, the court case that, that was just decided yesterday was was about software copyrights. Okay. Um, and, and basically, and it's actually it was, I think it's been the court case itself has been going on for like a decade or something like that. So these these things, especially if you have something where it's like a Google versus Oracle two gigantic companies. They're going to put a lot of money and time into this sort of thing, and, and they tend to, to drag out. Okay, so, um, but but this one was was about um, software copyright. Okay, and and basically, go ahead. I, I put in yeah. So here's I don't know. I'm not sure if you can read that, but basically, it's about this this Java programming language. Um, 
and uh, which which basically Oracle. I don't actually think Oracle. Oracle did not create Java. I think it was I forget who created it, but it, I think it was like another company. But they bought that company. So anyway, Oracle owned the rights to to Java, the copyrights to Java, and then at some point Google um, sort of re-implemented the technology. Okay, so they used the same like structure uh for for the um interface or the the api but then sort of rewrote the the machinery of the code um because they wanted to like use the same interface but they didn't want to have to pay oracle basically okay um and so like any um android phone basically runs java through this google um machinery okay so um yeah and so so but it, but but essentially what it came down to in this case is, is this kind of interesting area where you know, they, they, it, it, it's really about sort of standardization. Okay. So if you, th you think about like, there's always um, a need to, for, for people and companies to sort of standardize things. Okay. You need to be able to cooperate. And so if you think about something like USB, right, like USB, ABC, all those different things, you, you want to have a common standard so you can plug your phone into uh, you know, a certain charging port or whatever into your computer um, or a device into the computer. Uh, you want to have like a common standard, okay? And if if one company said, okay, well, we came up with a standard and you shall all use it and you have to pay us for it, they would kind of unduly be taxing the whole ecosystem for for not, I mean, like the, the shape of USB really isn't that important. The only important thing is that it is a standard standardized shape across devices, okay? Um, and so it's that kind of thing where it's like you, have, you need to standardize things and you don't want the copyright to get in the way of that. And you don't want one firm to sort of, to sort of, you know, extract all of the rent associated with standardization. You just want it to, to, to be distributed amongst the populace. Okay. Um, so this is sort of the same thing, but with software where it's like the API is the standard, how you implement it, you know, if you, if you have a, if you have a function that say takes a string and capitalizes it, that's like this, this, the standardization is what the function does. How you do that is, is a different thing. Okay. So, so this, this was kind of an interesting thing and, and, um, Possibly very important also because like obviously software is a huge industry um, and how you treat intellectual property uh, in, in the realm of software is, is going to have a big effect on that. Okay. Uh, probably things will change. Okay. I mean, like things will evolve over time, uh, especially as these cases come through. Um, but, but I think this is, is potentially a big deal. Okay. Um, yeah. But, but I guess the thing is that the takeaway here is that it's, it's complicated. You know I mean? It's, it's not, there's not an obvious, solution to all of these things okay uh because there's so many different competing parties and, and factors um and so at the end of the day sometimes you just have to sort of get down in the details and 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 figure it out and there's going to invariably be sort of legal battles associated with that okay um all right so that's that's a sort of an, an addendum on that fair use stuff okay so we already went through this sort of like the the um uh, increases in the, the rate of patenting per person. It's getting localized more and more, both geographically and in terms of industry. And those two are correlated for the very reasons that are outlined in, in the new geography of jobs. Okay. Um, and so on. Okay. So, um, all right. So I, I guess now I'm going to get it a little bit more into, um, the, the theory side. Okay. Uh, so I'll sort of pick up where we were last time. Okay. So, yeah. Um, okay. But let me, let me, I'll start off here on the slides and then jump over to the, uh, the written notes in a, in a moment. Okay. So but basically the last time right, we, we introduced this, this, this model of endogenous growth. Okay. And um, so sometimes this is called semi endogenous, the, the one I'm talking about here is called semi endogenous growth because um, we're, we're still, we, we're taking the number of researchers out there as sort of exogenously given. Okay. So, so it's, you know, before we would take the, the whole path of technology as exogenously given. So we're taking one step and saying, well, the number of researchers is exogenous. How many people are out there becoming researchers is exogenous, but then how that influences the path of technology is, is endogenized. Okay. Um, the next step of fully endogenous we'll talk about after this is where you actually make it so that people are deciding, do I want to be a researcher or a production worker? What are the incentives for that? And how does that all sort of pan out? That's fully endogenous. Okay, so this is this is sometimes called semi-endogenous. Okay, but this is really sort of the solo model of of knowledge goods. Okay, um, and it incorporates those things sort of the, the, this increasing returns notion. Okay, the spillovers and all that. 
uh, incorporates all of that uh, in sort of a succinct way. Okay, and essentially, you know, here you have um, the, this law of motion for for your know, knowledge or for technology. Okay, so it's saying the, the rate of change of of, uh, of knowledge and technology. I'll, I'll say technology. Of technology is you know it's proportional to existing technology. So you use existing technology, you build on it uh, to improve technology. Okay, so the the better your current level of technology is, the 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 more new technology you can produce. Okay, um, that's you know like printing press, computers, or just like knowing about you know knowing about semiconductors in order to make a transistor. You can't make a transistor and then semiconductors. You need to kind of go step by step. Okay, so um, it's one thing, and then and then R the other input is just that how many researchers you throw into this problem um, are there decreasing returns. That's fairly standard. Okay, so. Um, yeah, so that's the 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 sort of the, the the description of the the production function for for technology, um, in sort of rate of change form, okay, just a dot. Um, but but it is actually a little bit more intuitive to think about it in terms of growth rates. Okay, so we can define G to be the growth rate of A. All right, and the idea here is well, we see in the data. But we have roughly constant growth. We have roughly exponential growth in output and tech. If you, you know, when you guys calculate those solar residuals, Z, right, the growth rate of Z, you kind of see it. Well, it depends on the country, but say in the U.S., you see a pretty consistent, you know, two percent growth in that sort of thing. You see that in a lot of, uh, you know, most European countries and things like that. Okay, um, obviously in, in countries that are, are in transition, you see potentially you know, much higher growth rates. Um, but presumably, eventually those things will equilibrate, right? Um, and so the, the baseline is sort of this constant, at least in the, the uh, post, you know, industrial revolution is this constant growth rate. So that, that's kind of why it, thinking about it vis-a-vis -vis the data, you might want to think about it in terms of growth rates, okay? So you're, you're achieving continued proportional growth, okay? Um, and when, when you do like that, okay, then you, you, you kind of see it then as, as a, a, the balance between two things, okay? Um, on the one hand, as you get um, farther up the technological ladder, you know, making that next inventive step becomes more difficult. Okay, so if you look at what what kinds of things are is you know say uh, Intel or these, these I guess I'm focusing on semiconductors a lot, but what you know what kind of efforts is Intel putting into making the next generation of chips or like um, with phones, you know, like one G, two G, four G, five G, and so on. Um, what kind of efforts are they putting into that? Well, they're they're massive. Okay, so if, if Intel wants to um, r reduce the size of their their uh, chips to like you know from like fifteen nanometers to nine nanometers, uh, you know per feature, um, that's really a ton of money for research. Okay, and effort. Okay, so it's just it's just much harder to 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 make those improvements than say to make say the first semiconductor or to improve the first semiconductor. Okay, so you, you might, maybe you've heard the the phrase, you know, the, the low, you get the low hanging fruit first. Okay, so you, you get the easier stuff first. Every step after that becomes more and more difficult. Okay, so that's the that's pushing growth rate down. Okay, and the and the, the, the reason I say that is you know this um, term here on the bottom is a to the minus phi. Phi is say some number between zero and one for now. Okay, so this is a raised to some positive power, but it's in it's in the denominator. So it's it's if a goes up, other things being equal, say r being the same, it's going to push the growth rate down because it's, you know, it's just hard to make those next steps. Okay. Um, and then uh, on the numerator, so the opposing force is R, which is potentially going up over time. Okay. So you're, you're putting in more and more resources into, um, you know, uh, research and development. Okay. So maybe it's, um, you know, th here I'm just using R as a sort of an abstract index and, and I'm kind of thinking about it as researchers, but you could also think about it as the total amount of effort in terms of spending on, um, goods and capital equipment and researchers and all of that. Okay, but you're, you're putting more and more effort into research as well to counteract the fact that things are getting more difficult, okay? Um, and so that, you know, the, the way I'll, I'll talk about it here is basically you'll have a certain number, you'll have an increasing number of researchers um, tackling these problems, okay? And that's going to hopefully offset uh, the, uh, the dynamic where research is getting more difficult over time. Okay, and and sort of what we're looking for is, is sort of a path where um, those perfectly offset one another, and you you get this sort of constant growth rate. Okay, so um, and and the way you can think about it 
is you know say that our you know that we we just have this world where a certain you know one percent of people become researchers okay and they and they do research but the population itself is growing okay so r will be growing exponentially okay now <clears throat> r is growing exponentially and then so if, if a is a will be growing exponentially too right that the technology is going to be growing at a constant growth rate so exponential um if it's growing if a grows too quickly right then g is going to go down it's you're, you're going to sort of outpace what you're able to do in terms of research okay if it grows too slowly g will go up but if, if there's there's sort of an a, an exact growth rate where, th where things will sort of balance out okay um so that's that's kind of what we're gonna that's what we're gonna find basically okay so um yeah and so the way the the i'm, I'm ready i read it out here in terms of growth rates that point where things exactly balance is where the growth rate of the numerator that top term is equal to the growth rate of the denominator okay so the growth rate of uh just you know you can go back here the growth rate of this uh numerator is going to be so you use your rules of growth rates it's going to be eta times the growth rate of r the growth rate of the denominator is going to be one minus phi times the growth rate of a okay so that's that power rule for uh growth rates we're going to find where those two exactly balance out okay so that gives you this equation eta times the growth rate of sub g sub r uh is equal to one minus phi times g and g is just that the growth rate of a okay so if that's true we're, we're sort of in balance all right and what that tells you is well okay assume we know gr gr is just it's growing at two percent a year okay we know eta we know phi we can solve for g okay so just divide let me find this eta rho minus phi times gr okay and then the next step, which is, which is sort of what I said before, is that you're just putting a fixed fraction of <clears throat> researchers into uh, of people into research. So the the you know basically that what that means is R is equal to some fraction s of L at any given time. And what that means is that the growth rate of R is equal to the growth rate of L. Okay, they're just scaling it proportionally. Um, and we you know as as usual, we're going to assume that that the population itself is just growing exogenously at some rate. Which we'll say, which we usually call n. Okay, uh, unfortunately, eta and n look similar, but that's eta and that's n. Okay, so so this that means gr is going to be equal to n, and so then we finally get this equation. Okay, so this is sort of the key result that this this is your growth rate. Okay, and the two things you want to note about this are one the thing I I note on the slide here is that first it doesn't depend on s. It doesn't in the long run. It doesn't matter. Um, how what fraction of people you put into research okay because if you put in basically if you put in more people into research in the short run you will yes get an, an increase in the growth rate you're putting more people in the research clearly you should get an increase in the growth rate but but because then technology is growing faster it's also getting more difficult over time and it's doing so more quickly okay and that's sort of going to equilibrate at some point to the point where you go you return to the same growth rate regardless of what s is okay so essentially what's going to happen is if you did say you increased S from 1% to 2%, you'll grow faster in the short run, but then you'll eventually end up on a parallel path. Remember, we saw that before you end up on a parallel path in, in log space. So there's that, that there is a, a sort of a level effect, but there's no long-term growth rate effect. Okay. So that's what we saw in, I don't know, one of the homeworks we, we were looking at, uh, we saw a similar thing. Okay. So, um, so that's the dynamic there. Okay, so now that's where we that's where we we ended up last time, I think. Um, so now uh, maybe well, okay, well, I'll, I'll jump over to this. I'm gonna jump over the slide or the written notes in a second. But what we're gonna do next is think about some different cases for where these parameters lie, in particular phi. Okay, so what I was just showing you before, that's phi less than one. Okay, because in that numerator, right? So let me go over to the uh, slides. So this is I'm gonna, I'm gonna call this the Jones taxonomy for reasons that I haven't really explained to you, but I will explain to you. Okay. So um, you know, but before we were looking at the phi less than one greater than zero case. Okay. And and basically, you know, that that makes it so that you can uh, think about this growth rate equation, right? And that a on the bottom, if phi is between zero and one. Then that that means that technology is getting more difficult over time. That is, if A is higher, then your growth rate is is lower. Other things being equal, okay. And um, 
And it's, I mean, essentially, that phi, right, just, just so we have everything sort of handy here, you know, that phi is attached to A, and in the, in the, this is like our original equation that we started with, right? That phi tells you how, how important is prior technology uh, for past, uh, for, for future growth, okay? And so, you know, phi, phi between zero and one is sort of a middle range, okay? So if, if it's zero, past technology just doesn't help you at all for producing new technology, which doesn't really seem to be the case. Um, certainly it shouldn't be negative. It shouldn't be that past technology is, is actually actively bad for, for creating new technology, okay? Um, but then as it gets closer, you know, if, if it's greater than one, you actually sort of get that, it, it's really, it's so good, right? That, that you, you know, it's sort of more like what we'll see is like a singularity type thing where you get, you know, new technology makes uh, the future technology even easier to make. And there's just sort of like this runaway growth dynamic. Whereas between zero and one, it's sort of like you get some sort of stability, okay? So zero one sort of where we're gonna think things are gonna, reasonably exist okay especially if you look at the data okay um and and we we bit you know in the zero one case you know you exactly that's where you that's where we derive you know basically that you're gonna end up with uh, let's call it like g star the equilibrium growth rate is going to be just be that that equation that we derived just a second ago okay so that's that's like case number one i guess um the other case you can think of okay so there's greater than one let's hold off on that for a second Okay, let's think about phi equals one. Okay, so it turns out that phi equals one is sort of a special case. Okay, so phi between zero and one, we got that old outcome of phi exactly equal to one, which maybe you'd say is improbable that it would be exactly one, but let's just go with it. So what does that look like? So then in that case, we have a is equal to gamma a r to the eta. Okay, now, if if you look at um okay here if you look at this equation here okay if phi is equal to one okay actually this a just disappears okay so that's that's what we're gonna see here you know if you, if you start with original and just divide by a get eight out of a equals gamma equals gamma part of the eta nope okay. So, so there you, you actually get sort of a qualitatively different outcome, okay? Especially, you know, as we'll see in a second with regards to S. So the, the growth, then this is G, right? So G is, the growth rate of A is equal to gamma R to the eta. And if, if you remember, we had R, uh, we were generally assuming R is S times L. Okay, so this is S times L to the eta, okay? So that growth rate now, all of a sudden we hit phi equals one and then boom, the growth rate starts depending on S. Okay, so it's sort of this discontinuous change, the qualitative change in the behavior of the model. Um, so so the, that growth rate depends on, on S now. Okay, so this is sort of like maybe, this is what you would expect. You would expect, you put more, you, you put more researchers in, into a problem, you're gonna get more growth, okay? So if, in some sense, phi equals one is, is otherwise what you would expect, okay? Now that's, good in a way. I mean, maybe, you know, I mean, not, we shouldn't always want to just confirm our, our intuition and our priors about the stuff, but, but it seems like a reasonable property. Um, but the issue that arises, okay, is that you get um, these scale effects, right? You get these scale effects in the sense of, as think about L here, if L is growing exponentially, that means that your growth rate is growing exponentially, which is bad. Okay, we don't want that because we saw in the data, basically growth rates are generally flat. Okay, if the growth rate's going exponentially, that's a weird scene. Okay, so um, it sort of like doesn't seem empirically reasonable. Okay, so so if the population was constant, maybe then we're good. Okay, so so maybe maybe it's the case that the population is growing, but like the number of researchers isn't growing. You know, like you get you have a bigger population, but then a smaller fraction of people become researchers, and somehow it works out that the the number of researchers are is not growing. Uh, that doesn't seem to be the case. We actually do see more researchers in in you know just if you count them up uh, over time. Okay, so so it, th there seems to be something wrong with the phi equals one case in terms of fitting into the data. Okay, which. However, the, the one issue is that the phi equals one case is much easier to solve theoretically. Um, so we might still stick to it. It's, 
yeah, so so there are some issues, but it's not it's not not catastrophic. Okay. Um, all right, so that's phi equals one, and then there's phi greater than one. Kind of exciting, but ultimately probably more of an intellectual curiosity. Um, the phi phi greater than one is that the you know the the effect of of existing technology on new new generation of new technology is just large enough that you sort of get this runaway growth dynamic. Okay, so here. Um, I'll just sort of write it again for whatever reason. So here, uh, if you think about the growth rate of A, uh, you you know uh, uh, all I'm doing is writing it in a different way, but but I'm doing so because phi is greater than one. Okay, so I'm not moving the denominator now because you know this phi here, this phi minus one term is is positive. Okay, so a higher A actually increases the growth rate. Other things being equal. Okay, when phi is greater than one. Okay, so you have that superlinearity basically makes it so that past technology increases growth rate. Okay, so in some cases that that maybe is reasonable, like the printing press. Okay, or maybe like Wikipedia or something like that. But but maybe in other cases the dynamic where it's just like you find the good ideas first and everything after that is harder to, to discover. That you know you you just you discovered special relativity and general relativity, and it's kind of hard to know where to go from there. Okay, so. Um, you know, it, it varies, but but in, in this phi greater than one world, it's sort of like runaway growth is, is what you'd expect. Okay. Um, yeah, so then, okay, so you can, uh, it's, it's a, yeah, so you can actually show that, okay, you can show that there's runaway growth in this case. And I think this might be instructive in thinking about how to work with these types of models. Okay, so think about um, think about this equation here. Okay, that defines what g is going to be in the phi greater than one case. And what I'm going to drive here actually is true generally, but it, it's kind of more useful in this case. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to find the growth rate. We're going to go. We're going to go meta. We're going to find the growth rate of the growth rate. Okay, so the growth rate of g would be like g dot over g. Right. Okay. So we, but we can do that because we we still have our growth rate rules. All right. We still know how to do that. So in this case, the growth rate of the growth rate is going to be, well, that a term is going to give us phi minus one times the growth rate of a, which is g, and then the r term is going to give us eta times g r, which let's just say is 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 n. Okay. So this is going to be um, the growth rate of the growth rate. Okay. So, uh, and what you can see is that um, the higher the G is, okay, so G is, is larger, that growth rate is gonna be higher, okay? So that's where you get the runaway growth, right? So, so if, um, if phi was less than one, okay, so let's think through this. If phi was less than one, if G got larger, that would push the growth rate down, right? Because this would be like minus something times G if phi was less than one, right? So that's, that's stability, is that if G is larger, then over time it goes down. If it's smaller over time it goes up, that's gonna induce stability. Once phi, uh, sorry, once phi is greater than one though, you get instability that, that large, you know, this runaway growth where a larger G actually induces m m a higher G in the future. And you just, you just go off to infinity. Okay. Um, and, and you can show that, okay, you can actually show exactly what happens. So let, let's assume that N equals zero so that there's no population growth. Okay, in which case you're going to get uh, g dot over g would just be phi minus one times g, which means basically that g dot is equal to phi minus one g squared. Okay, so the 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 growth rate, the the derivative of the growth rate is something positive times the growth rate itself squared. Okay, um, and so here. You can actually solve. You can solve exactly what this is going to look like analytically. Okay. Um, and, and essentially, uh, well, I mm, it's probably not that useful to go through the derivation of this. Let me see how much time I have. Yeah, given our time situation, I'm not going to go through the derivation. You, you can basically kind of integrate both sides. Okay. And what you find, okay, is that it's going to look like this. Given some initial level of growth g zero, it's going to look like this. 
All right. Okay, and so what does that mean? Well, if you look at the denominator here, you know, as, if as t goes up, okay, so if t is zero, you start this term is zero and you just get g zero. So whatever your initial level of growth is. As t gets larger, eventually this this right hand term here is gonna hit one, and that that's a singularity. Okay, that 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 um denominator is gonna go to zero, and hence the the whole thing itself is gonna explode off to infinity. Okay, and so that's gonna if you plot it, okay, essentially you're going to start out at some initial level of growth, and then you're going to just sort of go out to infinity at some t star. Okay, in this case, t star would be, you know, 1 over g0 times 5 minus 1. Okay, so um, you just you just get the singularity, basically. In this. Okay, so that's seemingly not going to happen. Okay, so it, it does, it you know, but while, while it is sort of, um, interesting to, to work out the exact details. It doesn't seem like we're on track for that. All right. So um, the net result, okay. And, and sorry, and this was for no population growth. If there was population growth. This would be even more extreme. Okay. Because you'd, you'd be adding fuel to the fire. Okay. So um, net result, probably not going to do five greater than one, probably not going to do five less than zero. So we're going to be somewhere between zero and one. Okay. So now, okay, so that that that's 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 the Jones taxonomy. Okay, I never told you why I call it the Jones taxonomy. Okay, so I mean this is sort of like based on work that Jones did. Okay, we mentioned you know, Jones, the clean out the people that did beyond GDP. So Jones is sort of um, uh, does a lot of stuff relating to to economic growth in general. Okay, um, and so uh, the reason I call it a taxonomy is that you know for we'll we'll look at models later on. Okay, and we can always sort of classify it using this? Is it the type of model where you just converge to some growth rate, like with, with five between zero and one? Or is it the type of model where you can actually change the growth rate with policy, like in phi equals one? Or is it some sort of runaway growth model? Okay. So um, that that's sort of the use of this. Okay. Uh, all right. So that's, that's semi-endogenous growth. Okay. Let's jump back to the slides here. Um, Blah, blah, blah. Okay, so uh, I'm not gonna go over that. So uh, now we can we can kind of move on to fully endogenous growth. Okay, um, so so remember with semi endogenous, we we took one step. Instead of assuming that A evolved exogenously, we assume that R involved the you know instead of between technology A evolves exogenously, we assume that the number of researchers involves exogenously, but then how technology and the growth of technology plays out itself is sort of endogenous in the sense that we have that equation that describes its its progress. Okay, so um, that's, you know, step one. Okay, step two is, okay, well, clearly, you know, um, the, the number of researchers is not exogenous. Okay, it's the product of a bunch of individual decisions made by people and by firms and uh, governments and things like that, uh, that ultimately leads to that outcome. Okay, and in particular, it probably has something to do with with incentives and with profit motives and things like that. Especially for private firms, they're going to do research that they think is going to generate profits for them in the future. Okay, so that's sort of what what we're going to do here. We're going to we're going to we're going to be looking at a model that's uh, focused on private incentives. Okay, so we're going to think about firms doing research to generate new technology that they can then turn into new products that they can then sell profitably. Okay. And so in the background, okay, we are uh, assuming the existence of some policies to get around those issues of excludability that we've been talking about, right? Because if you're a firm and you come up with the new, you do research, you come up with the new technology and then you start producing and people just turn around and just copy that they are gonna, and then compete with you, you're probably not going to make any money or that, that much money. Okay. Um, and so there is kind of that need for some method of exclusion. Okay. And so then, you know, in the background, we're assuming some policy to induce that. Okay. So the simplest way to do it would say, okay, well, they, when you come up with a new technology, it's sort of clear, first of all, that, that it is new and it can be observed. Um, and there's, you know, a patent office and they give you a patent. Uh, and I've had less forever. Okay, that's the simplest way to do it. That's not obviously the most realistic way to do it, but that's the simplest way is that you just, you go in there, you go to the new technology, you get the patent, that makes you a monopolist, which means that you can make monopoly rents, i.e. profits, uh, 
and that lasts in perpetuity. Okay. Um, so, um, yeah, what am I saying here? I don't really know what I'm saying here. It's probably not that important on the slide. Um, yeah, okay, well, okay, so what I'm saying is that we're going to microfound. I forgot about this part. We're going to microfound, what, and that means that we're going to, there's going to be some aggregate outcome. Okay, and this this is a fairly popular way to approach things in, in macro nowadays. There, there's going to be some aggregate outcome, but we're going to generate that aggregate out, um, outcome by modeling micro-level elements like firms. Okay, so we'll have a bunch of firms doing research. Sometimes they're successful, sometimes they're not. Okay. When they're successful, they create a new product and they start selling it. Okay. That's going to be the, so there's all this sort of churn happening underneath. Okay. We can aggregate that at the end of the day. We'll, we can aggregate it and find out, okay, what's the overall growth rate? What's the overall growth of productivity? What's the overall growth of output and so on. Um, but we're going to generate with micro level incentives. Okay. Um, and that's, I don't know, it's, it's more realistic. It's, um, it could something you can match to the data. Like we might have micro level data and then it's just, if you can, you know, it, it's better to have that. If, if you can match a model to data, it's better to, to try and meet the data where it is, you know, um, rather than just looking at aggregates and treating, treating countries and, and, and things like that. as just totally aggregated, you know, units. You, you want to, you want to make sure that you capture the dynamics at, at multiple levels. Okay. Um, Okay, so that in, in particular, the model that I'm going to talk about is called the Romer model. Okay, so there's this guy by the name of Paul Romer um, who uh, did some research on, on endogenous growth. I think, yeah, he won the Nobel Prize. I think, yeah, he won the Nobel Prize um, a couple of years ago, maybe even like two years ago. I can't remember um, for that work mostly. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's so, but it, it was sort of foundational in a way in terms of how do you think about uh, these issues, but, but, but really what it's doing is sort of operationalizing some of that stuff we were talking about with increasing returns and, and excludability. Okay. So, um, yeah, so that's, that's, that's what we're going to do. Okay. Uh, I guess we don't have that much time. Okay. To, to go through it. Okay. So I'll just sort of give you the intro and then we can, we can work from there. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything in terms of preparatory remarks that I want to say about the model. Uh, so it's micro-founded. Okay, we're going to be looking at incentives. We're assuming in the background some policy. Okay, yeah. And so the, the other thing I, I, I want to say, though, is that um, in general, when we're thinking about endogenous growth models, okay, you know, there's a million different types of endogenous growth models that you can write. And let me assure you, people have written many of them. Um, and But two of the, the main... Kind of flavors that we'll see okay one is this romer model okay and what the romer model looks like is basically people there's a bunch of products or product lines out there okay and every product is produced by one firm okay a monopolist and they have like a a, a patent of infinite length associated with that and then the, but there's people doing research and coming up with new products okay and they come up with new products and it's just, it's sort of like this long tail. You just come up with a totally new and different product. Okay. So it's, it's more like movies or music. Okay. You just come up with a new thing, a new album, a new, a new movie. Okay. And maybe, maybe people listen to it. Okay. Um, and so, so there's not that much sort of head to head competition. Okay. You're just like, oh, here's another thing you can buy. Okay. Um, it is true that like, if you buy product A, or, you know, you're going to probably have to buy less of, you buy more of product A, you, you may have to buy less of product B. Okay. So there's sort of like some vague sort of competition going on, but it's not, it's not sort of head to head. Okay. You're just sort of expanding the set of products. Okay. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so, so that's the idea for, for Romer is, is um, you're, you're expanding the set of products. Okay. So people can buy more things. Okay. Uh, they can buy more sort of differentiated goods. Okay. So it, it's a lot like you see when people talk about stuff like the long tail of, of products, it's like, you're not um, necessarily making like cheaper products or anything like that. You're just making like more varieties of products. And so like maybe, you know, I, I think, I think the analogy is, is sort of apt for like music and movies. It's just like, there's a bunch of different niches and as time goes on, those get more and more explored. 
Um, and that's good because people have particular tastes and they like watching or listening to different particular types of music. Um, and that, that's sort of that, that gains coming from variety. Okay. So that's, that's a Romer type model. Okay. And then the other one that I'll talk about mostly is this, is what's called sort of a Schubertarian type model. Okay. So the, so the, that references, uh, Joseph Schumpeter, <clears throat> who's, uh, quite a bit older than Romer. Schumpeter was around a while ago, possibly over a hundred years ago, certainly more than a hundred years ago. I don't remember exactly, probably in the 19th century. So he's, he's sort of an old style, um, you know, like proto-economist kind of person. Um, but, but his, uh, big thing was on sort of like these forces of creative destruction. Okay. And that's, that's more of like a head to head notion. Okay. Of competition. Okay. Wherein I'm producing in the particular product line, I'm the incumbent. I make, um, uh, what do I make? I guess I make, um, bread makers. Okay. I make a particular bread, a bread maker, a cell phone or something like that. Okay. Uh, some kind of, let's say it's a capital, like a, like a, like a somewhat advanced type of technology just to make it interesting. Um, you come along, you make a better version. Okay. It's faster. It's cheaper. I don't know. It's better in some way. Uh, and you start selling it. Okay. And so then people may decide, okay, I want to buy that new, more exciting type of product. Okay. Um, so that's more head to head. So it's not like you just make something else and go, like, Oh, I like that thing, but it's, it's not quite the same as the existing product. It's really like we're competing to make the best variant or best version of an existing type of product. Okay. Um, and so, so there, you know, the, the, the reason he called it creative destruction is that, well, you're, you're creating something, you're creating value because you're making a, a something that's more efficient or higher quality. Um, but you're destroying, well, you're destroying the old company, right? If you, if you come in and you disrupt or displace that existing market, you're, you're destroying the old company. Okay. And so that, that, and that's not just profits, you know, a stream of profits or, or, you know, stock value that you're, 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 you're affecting there. I mean, it's like the people that work at that company and um, the places that those companies operate and everything like that. Okay. So it has, you know, um, a variety of, of different impacts. Okay. Some, some of which are pretty tough. Um, so, so that's that notion of creative destruction, but, but, but it, you know, sort of the, the formulation of it, you know, is, is that you sort of, you kind of need, you can, you, you, it would be great if you could have one without the other, but it's kind of tough. Okay. Um, that you need contestability and disruption for sort of markets to continue to function. If you didn't have contestability, you'd get entrenched monopolies. And we know that there are all sorts of huge issues with that, especially once they start spilling over into the political realm. Okay. And then once we start thinking like that, actually that that's, that's that type of logic is actually the, the logic that inspired a lot of the sort of framework that, um, uh, Jim Ogle and Robinson were using in, in why nations fail, whether it's applied, you know, narrowly to, um, technology and product markets, or whether it's applied more generally to, uh, political situations and, and things like that. Okay. So, um, so that, so, so yeah, so that's, that's the Schumpeterian sort of creative destruction kind of thing. Okay. Um, both of these are going to feature potential inefficiencies. Okay. So especially in the Schumpeterian case, you might think that there could be, well, there could be too little research, right? Because if you think about, um, I come up with a new, a new product. Okay. And that generates some consumer surplus that, that sort of lasts forever because that product just exists starts existing and it exists forever, let's say. Um, but if someone comes along and creates a better version of that and displaces me, well, I enjoy a stream of profits that sort of I'm capturing that surplus for a time, but then I get, I get booted out and someone else gets that stream of profits. Okay. Um, and so I'm only capturing like a part of that surplus. Okay. And if I'm only capturing a part of that, that total surplus, then I'm not internalizing the, the societal benefit of that. Okay. And so I may invest less than is efficient. Okay. So that's sort of the basic logic for why you would, you might expect to see, uh, under investment. Okay. Um, uh, in, in this type in research and in, in ideas and technology, because essentially there's a misalignment between the societal surplus, the social benefit, and then the private benefit. Okay. Um, and, and essentially the, the idea is that maybe, you know, firms are sort of, they're too short sighted that, you know, they're only looking for that next quarters earnings or something like that. They're not thinking about that, the total societal benefit over time. Okay. Um, 
So, so that's one thing is that underinvestment. Um, you could actually kind of cook up intuition for an overinvestment, okay? Which is that like, um, you know, may, maybe there's a firm out there that's producing, and, and I come up with something that's just slightly better, okay? And I come in and, and, and displace them, and may, maybe I haven't really improved the product that much. It's just a little better, and that's enough to get people to jump over to me. Um, and so you you might think that well, I made you know that product one percent better. But I captured, you know, a hundred percent of the market share. Okay, so so in that sense, you know, maybe maybe the, the incentives are too high, and there's just too much churn. Okay, and then once you when and if you especially if you think about the disruption caused by that, um, say in the labor markets and, and geographically, maybe you know that that's another worry. Okay, so you can you can always you know it's, it's economics. You can cook up intuition for A or B or not A or not B, right? So um, the true answer, well, it comes down to what type of model you're entertaining and it comes down to what the data says about that okay so um we'll get there okay eventually um all right and so so i guess yeah and so i guess a lot of that was um sort of talking about the which I, which i think is is quite useful it's a, sort of a useful way to think about the world um you can we'll, we'll look at similar stuff with with a, a, a romer sort of model okay there it's a little bit more tilted towards you'd expect under investment okay for a variety of reasons um but yeah yeah so so we'll do that too